going on, guys? It is Brian and Jack with Simple Man's Comics, and this, of course, is the Bolo Show coming to you with that live premiere every week where we are talking about new comic book day and the recap of the hottest books. We're talking about that first appearances. We're talking about that reader buzz. We're talking about that variant buzz, and we are talking about Jack's long-term play. Once again, this show is pre-recorded. We record it Wednesday night, but we always do that live premiere so we can participate in that live chat with everyone. And it is also important to know that this show is brought to you from Slabbed Heroes. Oh, good old Nick Dwartman at SlabbedHeroes.com. Make sure you guys check them out for raw comics. He's got store exclusives now. He's got guaranteed nine eights at a great price. But before we get into anything else, Jack, how was your new comic book day? Man, it was great. This is another exciting new comic book day for me. There were several releases I was really excited to read. Um, several that were on my list for like a couple months dating back to previews about issues that I was really anticipating from a collector standpoint. So I'm excited to talk about comics this week more than most. So it's been a couple good weeks in a row. I will say we did not coordinate the brothers in red tonight. Yeah, but right, right. <laughs> got Muhammad Ali and Flash. So... Either way, also, we mentioned last week, we were talking about a Patreon. If you want to support the channel, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Simple Man's Comics. We got tiers all the way from $1 all the way up to that premium bolo box tier, which is the $35 tier, which gets you that premium bolo box. We're hitting you with those Frankie Comic exclusive variants. We got some CBSI variants coming in. We even have some Slabbed Heroes books to throw in there coming up, but December's also, those people got their shirt sizes in, so they're getting that exclusive Simple Man's Comics Patreon Carnage shirt that was printed just for this box and not printed again, but we also announced last week we're going to give one away, right, Jack? That's right. We have a bonus bolo box going out to somebody from the YouTube Simple Man's Comics family, um, and we are excited to give that away today. Right. So it's... That bolo box is going to be the normal bolo box. Sorry we couldn't throw a t-shirt in this one because we didn't know who would win, what shirt size to include, or anything like that. The shirts have already up to the printers. But the person that will be getting a premium bolo box is Lala Schultz. To win this, you had to comment on last week's video within the first 24 hours. We put those up. We threw them in the random.org. And the person that came out on top was... Lala Schultz with her comment, I am totally drinking the Kool-Aid on the X-Men right now, but I understand what you thought House of X, Powers of X wasn't that great. I mean, clones, I get nothing too earth-shattering there, but I love the grannies in X-Men number three. So, I think she was talking a little bit in your direction with that, Jack, because you were talking about how yeah. the Hickman, I kind of enjoyed House of X, Powers of X, which is weird, because maybe it's because I'm not a big X-Men fan. But either way, Lala Schultz, Email me your mailing address at simplemanscomics at gmail.com and we will get that premium bolo box out in the mail to you. And make sure you stay tuned to this show because you never know, we're going to be doing another giveaway very soon. But with that being said, we will bring this week's bolo list up on the screen. What would you think about the list, Jack? I, like I said, this was one I was excited about. Uh, there are a few books that I kind of uh, had earmarked for a long time that I was excited to kind of get into and, and read, collect. Um, one that I had read in advance, and I was just excited to get those covers. Um, so th this was a good one in my estimation. Yeah. Wasn't a great new comic book day for me because I was so busy with work and then took kids to see Christmas lights tonight. Then getting a three up, three down edited up there for people to watch. So I actually... Full transparency, I, didn't, I haven't had a chance to read a book yet. I've heard a bunch of great news about books, but by the time this airs, I will have my hands full and be reading some of those books. But as of right now, sad face, I haven't read, been able to read it. That's not going to stop us from getting into this. And we're going to start with the first appearances. And the first book we're going to talk on first appearances this week is Ghost Rider number three. All right, this is the first appearance of Necrosis. Um, looks like a possible uh, villain. You know, there was some excitement over it, but um, as we will talk about later, I think there was one first appearance that outshined all of them. So I think some of the first appearances this week kind of went under the radar. 
it'll be interesting to see if this is one that can gain some popularity over time. I don't know. I'm a little skeptical of Ghost Rider's market kind of like popularity and legitimacy. I'm a big Ghost Rider fan, but I just Ghost Rider's never really been a a character or a property that's really popped. Yeah, Ghost Rider seems to have a cult following. I mean, some people like certain ones, but Donnie Cates kind of made stuff relevant again with Cosmic Ghost Rider. And then there was, of course, the was it a Hulu show or were they doing a Disney Plus that kind of got scrapped for now? Yeah, it looked like a Hulu show, um, Spirits of Vengeance, and now it seems to be kind of on hold. Right, and the Hulu show is where Disney's taking their shows where they can do a little bit more than what PG, right? Right, right. So, next book we want to talk about for first appearances is Symbiote Spider Man Alien Reality number one. There's a whole bunch of covers for here, so I kind of just collaged it up as you can see on the screen. But what do we got going on with this one? Well, we have a few things. Um, this one was featured in multiple categories. So like we always do on the show, we're not going to kind of retread and retalk about it. So first off, the first appearance, cool looking character we don't know much about. Um, but uh, we have a new black cat appears to be Mary Jane. Um, again, from a, a collecting standpoint, I don't know that like this is an alternate reality thing. Obviously, it's with right within the title. So I don't know that this is going to be like something that is going to be hot in the secondary market or anything. But what I want to really talk about is these variants. Um, we give Marvel a lot of a lot of shit, to be honest with you, about the overabundance of variants. But I think it's also important to give them credit when they do it right. Um, and we talked about Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, Ninja Turtles, how kind of like they had a perfect variant program. I'm going to go out on a limb and say I, I think Alien Reality did the same. They had the entire team of Young Guns do variants. These variants are actually homages to other popular Spider-Man covers. As a kind of like 80s, 90s kid, a lot of these covers kind of really resonate with me. Um, and I even like the fact that they, um, they kind of homaged some covers that are kind of sort of under the radar my favorite being that thanos cover that's spider-man 17 from the mcfarlane run that's kind of a lesser known issue um it was really cool to see that um get an homage um of course you've got like that wedding annual um spider-man i think 100's in there um so there's several different ones and then we talk about the colored blanks we're big fans of that both brian and i we think opens a whole new world of sketch art um and we've talked about how marvel has kind screwed of the pooch the, yeah they made the mistake of making those high ratio they got it right with ghost rider doing that one a black um blank and that was at cover price and alien reality also has a black blank at cover price now, I'd like to see them do more than the black at cover price. Yeah. But either way, we're talking about a black suit Spider-Man. There's so much cool art that can be done with these covers. So I have to say, shout out to whoever was in charge, whatever editor was in charge of this book. I think they did a really good job on this program. There's a high ratio variant too as well, a 1 in 50. Um, but I think they did a really good job with this one. Yeah, and the good thing is even the blank is still like an homage to that, what, the, the, the September 11th issue, right? Right, right. So. Yeah, in a way. But the next one we wanted to talk about on first appearances is Spider-Verse number three. Right, this is the first appearance of a new character called X. Don't know much about this character. Really kind of cool looking, which I think makes a big difference. If you're at all a Spider fan, you need to be picking up these Spider-Verse books. There's an, a first appearance in every issue um and we really don't know where these things are going to lead but we know that with all of the um kind of future spider into the spider verse movies um with tom holland's movie series continuing to see success with the kind of fervor over the future into the spider verse live action movie with all of the rumored talk about donny cates one day taking over spider-man we saw that image on his Twitter of him and Ryan Stegman at the Marvel offices standing next to a Spider-Man mural saying big plans for the future. Right here on the Civil Men's Comics YouTube channel, you can check out a throwback video I did with Donny Cates like three, four, five years ago. I don't even remember how long ago. 2017. Uh, 17, there you go. So two years ago. 
Uh, that's how that's how time moves when you're doing comics. But um, it was right before he signed with Marvel, and uh, you know he talked about the two properties he wanted to do: Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Amazing Spider-Man. Um, I think it's a given that he does both of those. I'll tell you. Um, and we've been saying that for years, right, Brent? You and I have been talking all year that like he's gonna do Spider-Man. That's gonna happen. Yeah, and is he rumored to do like a one shot at least for Buffy? Yeah, yeah, he's been he's been working um, behind the scenes to try to make that happen. Um, you know, that was a that was one of those things that we've brought up to Boom Studios before. Is let's make that happen, man. <laughs> um, so it's just you know it's a red tape thing. So it, it's gonna happen though. I have full confidence. Um, I have no back back end knowledge of it. I just wholeheartedly believe you're not going to keep Donnie away from those properties. Right. And that was it for first appearances. That was actually on the Bolo list, but there was some news that came out late breaking last night and seems to be a really big topic today on new comic book day. And we are talking about miles Morales, Spider-Man number 13. We're talking about the first appearance of miles sister. We're talking about a whole bunch of stuff that I don't I'm not going to say I don't find important, but I think it's being overplayed. And I think these books are going for pretty high right now, Jack. Right? Yeah. More than what was, I think they should be for what the first appearance is. But they were, going, they were going for 20 to 25. We're starting to see um, the undercutter wave come through. Shout out to Mel Vaughn, who loves that term, undercutter wave. But we're starting to see that begin to happen, um, which is inevitable, right? Because this wasn't a hard book to get. Um, so... But no, we've been talking about how this, great just the story is by itself. Right. You and I have both been advocates of, of this series. Um, I, I think that this has been the best Spider-Man series consistently. This is a book on my poll. So before we, I start giving the little Bolo rant on this one, save your he missed it comments. He didn't miss, he didn't miss it. Um, this wasn't a hard book to get your hands on if you knew about it early enough. It wasn't on the list, and for the integrity of the list, when we find out about things after the list has been put out, we don't we're not a delete and repeat kind of guys. We take integrity community very seriously. I'm not gonna delete the list and add something and I'm not gonna do that. The list is the list. We say it all the time, it's never gonna catch everything, right? This is what's great about comics is when you get a first appearance you don't see coming. Now I want to say shout out to my man Greg at Comic Spec on Instagram. You can follow him, but he's never posted a picture. But he communicates with me in the DMs a lot. And he actually alerted me to this very early, um, before the key collector alert, before like a lot of things that people were aware of. I, and I mean, I have to give credit. I also saw it late last night on Comics Heating Up. Is where I first yeah, saw it. Yeah, I, I, I saw that later. I think Comics Heating Up may have been the first person um, to put it up. Because I know a lot of people have been attributing the Key Collector app. And we love to give the Key Collector app credit where credit's due. Um, but they were later than other um, other entities on this one. So I found out about it from my man Greg. Um, he, he hit me up in the DMs and asked me as the list went live if I was aware of it. I said it wasn't. He sent me a screenshot of the image. And we talked about it briefly, and I said, I think it's a great long-term play. And I stand by that, right? I think it's a very good long-term play. I don't think they would have created this character for no reason. I think the writer who's working on this is invested in Miles, right? I think he's there for the long haul. Um, He's done all the offshoot one-shots, whether it's Miles Morales, the end that's coming up, um, whether it's, like, you know, these crossovers. I really think that... um, they created this character for a reason. We'll see what that is. The pricing is speculation FOMO. It's what it's why you and I kind of get burnt out with that aspect of the hobby. Um, because we've seen it all, done it all. And when you do that, some, maybe sometimes you can be cynical. But it's nuts to me to pay $25 for this book right now. If you're trying to make a profit, what, what do you think it's going to sell for do you realize what you would need to sell this book if you're buying it for 25 Now, buy what you like. You do what you want to do. But if you're buying this to make a profit, you're buying it for 25 how can you make a profit? I have gone on record and said that my rant about Star was probably wrong, right? But it really wasn't wrong because I said don't buy that book at 25 Still to this day, you can't make real profit on that book if you bought it at 25 So how are you going to make profit on this? And then... Let's look at history, because history 
in comics repeats itself over and over again, right? We have a hard time with first appearances that are baby appearances. Look at Jonathan Kent, a character who... Yeah, Convergence, right? Convergence 2. In my opinion, I've, I've discussed it with the creator of that character, who has told me on record that that's the first appearance in his mind because that's when the birth was shown. But the market tries to play games and say that that's not a first appearance. I, I'm of the opinion it doesn't matter that if it's a baby. But regardless, no, like you've said, Brian, on the channel before, a baby appearance doesn't get you hyped because it's not really – uh, anything you can wrap your head around of why you should buy a baby in a comic, right? You you're, you want to see that final form. So the point is, there's such a split debate on this topic that if she becomes something, and I imagine she will, whatever she becomes, there'll always be that split between, well, is it this issue or is it that future issue? That's the important one. And that is going to dictate profitability. Um, if you grab this book at cover price, by all means do it. I did. I don't fault you. But if you were grabbing this book and, and you're grabbing it at, up the ladder at 2025, if you're getting those FOMO itches and you're running on eBay and, oh, I need the, I need the 2099 cover and, oh, I need the 2020 cover, um, you know, you, you're going to end up holding the bag, and those are the things that burn people out, right? And that's where they start blaming people. So then they start blaming the Key Collector app, or they want to blame Comics Heating Up. No one's making you do it. And we've advocated on this channel, be smart, take your time. I promise you that this issue will be back to $10 or below, in my mind, within a few weeks. The funniest thing about this is, no matter what you think this baby will become, when is she going to become it? She's a baby. Unless we're going to time jump something serious, right? And to do that, we would take Miles from a team. It's going to be in the, the Miles, the end one shot. And I can see that. I, right, I can see her in the Miles, the end one shot being like the next Spider-Man. Or being Gwen, Spider, you know, Ghost Spider, or something of that nature. But again, that's the point is... She's a character who's like 17 years younger than Miles. Um, Could be you, the next baby Jack-Jack. <laughs> yeah. If you age her up... I love the Incredibles. <laughs> if, you age, if you age her up to, say, an age where she could be a hero, you put Miles into his mid-30s, and that really kind of changes who Miles is as a character. So to me, this is one where I'm like, I'm not missing this at cover price. I'll grab it and throw it in a box and forget all that market talk. You and I have advocated this series as an amazing reader series the entire time for the last year. But this, the pricing and the FOMO that I see on this is nuts. And it just doesn't seem to like, it doesn't miss me because it's one of those things where when Bleeding Cool runs an article, when a comic's heating up has it, when Key Collector's putting out an alert, People tend to think, like, I have to act now. I have to act now. I have to act now. Patience, man. Patience wins out in, the, in that game. Yeah. Long story short, if you buy that cover, buy that cover. Don't go chasing those expensive prices because yeah. most likely it's going to fall back down. But it's still a great, like Jack said, they wouldn't create the character for no reason. Just not worth spending that much money. But that's no. that's just our opinion, right? What? Buy what you like. If you want to spend that money, have at it. Yeah, just save me with that he missed it stuff in the comments. That that's why I'm saying that. No, that's that's been our long-standing opinion on these types of matters. And that wraps up first appearances for this week. So we're gonna go right now into that reader buzz section. And first book we want to talk about on the reader buzz is Superman number eighteen. This is supposed to be that big issue where he gives the reveal the identity, right? Yeah, and let me tell you something, it did not um, disappoint. I want to be careful going into too much detail about this. Brian and I, we did a video on Superman 17. We said we were going to talk about this one in Lois Lane number 7. We are still going to do that. So we will give you our like full detailed analysis on this book. Um, at that time, I will say I loved this issue. There were There was a couple panels in this issue. Not to be like corny, but like it's like comics emotional, right? You have those panels where you're like, 
man, this is epic. This is this is so cool. And um, the the press conference scene, um, the way he delivers kind of his his manifesto of why he is who he is to the people, um, the interaction with him and Perry, um, I think are excellent moments. And Brian Michael Bendis is one of those writers who does these sort of emotional stories very well. So this one to me delivered. I have no idea what it's going to do on the secondary market. I don't really care. To me, this is a reader book. I never understood why 17 popped the way that it did. Um, and it's come, come all the way back down to earth from Krypton, you know, and now sitting uh, back at like cover price. Um, but I don't, you know, this one I think will be heavily ordered, but I think will be a classic issue from time. This is one, if you love Superman, you need to have this in your collection. So without giving too much spoiler, did that kid play a part in this issue that was in the last panel of the 17? Um, it seems to continue to be a tease. Okay. Um, so, you know, um, I, I got to do a second really, like, deep dive read. Um, I did some, like, prepare for the show kind of quick reads, but I, I, like I said, I want to really get into it deeper before you and I sit down and really talk about it, but um, it, it what, he wasn't the uh, focal point. Then the next one we're talking about the reader buzz is that Dark Knight Returns, The Golden Child. I was like, I thought this was going to be an Eddie Murphy book. But... <laughs> That's, I, every time I hear this book, I think about that Eddie Murphy movie. <laughs> but, yeah, I, to be honest with you, I'm not, I wasn't excited for this one. How but we're, one thing I will say is we got some DC incentive variants out of this. Yeah, yeah, and but they killed me with the Master Race stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, I it's no secret. Like I, you know, like everybody else, I I, I resell, I sell on eBay, I um, I do conventions. I bought those Master Race incentives at like seventy five percent off sale on at Midtown. Still can't sell those things. <laughs> so. Um, this was one that, like, I was. I've heard a lot of hype about this issue. Full disclosure, I haven't read it yet. I will read it. Frank Miller's hit or miss for me. I, his Daredevil run is like iconic to me. Um, I enjoyed the first Dark Knight, like everybody else. Um, Dark Knight Two Master Race didn't really do it for me. So, um, I'll just say I enjoyed his earlier work, but more. Yeah. I'm not a Sin City guy. Yeah. So the the last uh, the Superman storyline he wrote for Black Label, I wasn't it wasn't bad. It just wasn't classic Frank Miller that I'm used to. And I know there's a lot of people out there that really enjoyed it. It just didn't wasn't the best for me. I'll say that I liked it only from the aspect of I expected nothing going into it, and it was better than I expected it to be. Yeah. But, but I will yeah. say his writing's still better than his art. I would tend to agree with that um especially at this point yes especially with that old one i always think of that wonder woman variant he did yes and, I, and the sad thing is that's all you have to say and i know exactly the one you're talking about um, <laughs> yeah. and like the the best um the best like master race variants right were done by other people the jim lee stuff alex garner um like there's an alex garner wonder woman variant i can't remember what issue number it is but it's fantastic um, that you know the Joker variant is fan- right. by Jim Lee is fantastic, but uh, it's, t- it's hard sell selling those Dark Knight books these days. Yeah. But the next one we're talking about on the reader buzz is Immortal Hulk number twenty eight. This is another book we talked about on the last call show as well. Right. This would usually be one of my like first reads. I haven't gotten to this one yet because there were some other ones that um, sort of jumped it. Um, I'm excited to read this one. This one is the return of the brigade. Um, this one is kind of like kind of a Hulk on Hulk battle. Um, I love that Alex Ross cover. That Alex Ross cover is absolutely amazing. Um, you can almost say that about every issue, right? Though, yeah. so like it's it's like that's almost like a corny statement at this point. But um, you know, I think Alex Ross, Alex Ross, and Al Ewing have been. Just an amazing, amazing duo. And we've talked about that before. Like, Al Ewing is somebody who, I don't know that, I mean, his Avengers run was big. But I don't know that he was ever really on my radar as somebody I like to pay attention to. 
and he's done so well with this. Whatever series he gets announced on next, it's I'm going to pay attention to it. I'm going to check it out just because of how well he's delivered this one. Yeah, I definitely, um, I know we've said it before, but his Avengers No Surrender from there on has been exceptional, including with Immortal Hulk. And every time you right. think there's going to be a lull in Immortal Hulk, some, a new arc starts and it just kind of picks up the excitement again. Yeah, and if you've never read his Avengers No Surrender run, but you love his Immortal Hulk, um, I would strongly suggest you check it out because essentially Avengers No Surrender is like the prequel to yeah. Immortal Hulk. Like it ties in so strongly. Um, the, a prologue. Right. There's no doubt you will enjoy it. So um, I, that's a strong reader recommendation at this point. Um, and those trades are out there. The next book we're talking about is Red Mother Number yeah. One. This is the uh, big release from Boom Studios this week. So Boom does it big again, man. Um, you know, uh, this one may not have like the secondary market penetration that some of the other books have had. This was one of my favorite reads. It, this one in is okay. So if I rank them right, it's almost unfair because I love all four of these books. Yeah, and the stories are kind of different. All different, which is why I love Boom Studios. People give us, you know, they give us hell about talking about Boom or even I talk about IDW, you know, and we get those, you know, uh, there's no kickback. There's no, you know, there's not paid for play. Um, I just legitimately, those are my two favorite publishers and those are my two favorite publishers for the exact reason that we're talking, the variance in story. So you look at those, those hits that Boom has run out. Red Mother is my favorite. Something's Killing the Children is my second. Once in the Future is my third. And Folklords is my fourth. But having said that, I love Folklords. But Red, that's, Red Mother to me, um, when I read it, the first thing I thought was, it reminds me of an episode of Law & Order SVU, where like if you turn on an episode of Law & Order SVU, you're watching the episode. If you didn't know how the format of the show was, you think you're watching something with the characters that are going to be featured then you realize, nope, somebody dies, and then the title card comes up, the theme music comes up, and it's like, no, now we're getting into the episode. That's kind of how the writing style of this book is, where you have some events take place early in the book, and then all of a sudden you go to like a title page, it's all red, and it says Red Mother, and you realize, oh, no, now we're getting into what this story really is. Um, so they only give you a very little bit of like the current kind of like what's going on now. They give you that backstory. I really like it. The actual events that I think are going to take place within this book, it doesn't happen to like the last page, the last panel. But boom, uh, it doesn't matter what writer it's been, has done a hell of a job with these like final panel tie-ins to the next issue. Um, comic books, it's hard to be scary, right? You can do horror, but it's hard to be scary. Especially, it's not like really a jump scare when you can see the full page ahead of you. <laughs> right. Um, but that last panel, man, we talk about visualizing a movie. In a movie, I think that would be a scare the bejesus out of you panel. Um, and it makes it makes me go, who the hell is that? And I can't wait to get into the next issue to really find out. Um, That's not and- how Nailbiter was for me. Oh, I mean, Nailbiter is a series. I, I You and I have talked about that before. Like, I absolutely love Nailbiter. Um, so the second print, which isn't out yet, but just to give you kind of some be on the lookout, the second print for Red Mother features that character on the cover from that last panel. That's one I think be on the lookout for. Um, also, boom, you know what, man? Give them credit. Like, they try different stuff, right? So you got to thank you, Variant. That's something Boom's done. That's that black and white cover on the far right. You know, we've, they've got their cover B that you can see. They've got their um, their J. Lee uh, FOC. But they also slipped in like a secret, a ver- a secret variation that was at like a 1 in 10 ratio. Um, so dealers who ordered heavy. And again, the Boom has the Boom Guarantee Program. So what that means is stores can order heavy on issue number one because it's returnable. And any store who, like, took that leap and rode this one out with Boom got rewarded with that 1 in 10 uh, ratio. So if you're only ordering three or four, you might not have got one. But if you were ordering deep on this one, 
you got that extra one in ten ratio, and be on the lookout for that because stores may not be. You'd be surprised how many LCSs don't pay attention to the internet, aren't communicating with, through email. Um, they probably got an email from either Diamond or Boom directly, but they may not have paid attention to it, and you may find this on your shelf. I had a lot of people tell me they were finding them on the shelf today, so that's one to, to kind of be on the lookout for. Then the next book we're going to talk about is Captain Marvel number 13. Outside of me liking that Mark Brooks cover, I'm still waiting to pick this up in a trade. Yeah, and you know what? This was the first issue, Brad, I didn't like. So we there's another Avenger death. Uh, it's Tony Stark. And when, when Thor died... Everybody was like, well, how are they killing Thor? And then we have a new Thor series come out. Well, you get the answer to that because you find out that she's not really killing them. She's called upon Singularity, who first appears in A-Force number one. There's a 125 that she's on the cover. Um, and she's putting them kind of like in that like pocket dimension. Um, so even within Captain Marvel, dark Captain Marvel, Carol Danvers is, like, sabotaging Vox's plan. Um, and Vox's plan is revealed to be that he's, like, cloning all the Avengers or attempting to clone all the Avengers. Uh, so it looks like he's going to try to have, like, some form of, I don't know, evil. But when they did that, I was like, man, this is just so Marvel. Like, this is, I don't know. I got to reread it, but it didn't It didn't hit, like, like uh, the last few issues, like, when I read them, I was like, Man, that was a great issue. This one, I was kind of like, oh, this is where they're going with this? I was kind of bummed out. So um, let us know in the chat like, if, if you, you felt some serious heat about this one. But, you know, I this morning there was a comment on my Instagram from our contest winner, as a matter of fact, Lala Schulte. And she said she was excited for this one and Ninja Turtles. I would say those two as well as Red Mother and Superman were the ones I was anticipating the most. And this one, I think of all of them was the solid letdown of the group. But that's, again, that's my opinion. Um, I'd love to hear from you guys in the chat how you felt. You know how I feel. I'm waiting for the trade. <laughs> maybe if this is the start of a new arc, maybe I won't, have, won't read this one in the trade. But either way, next book we're talking about is... Dying is easy, number one. This is one that we kind of highlighted also during the last call, but we were surprised that this one had that 1 in 25 incentive too, right? Yeah. And this is one that a lot of like indie, like my indie indie people, right? The people who like really like get down. Fear and loathing in Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're hype about, but it's not getting mainstream hype. Yeah. I thought this one might do better. I think it's a victim of rough release week. Well, and look, that and they, IDW had kind of had a big release the, the same day. Exactly, which, you know, the more heavy marketing is going to go into. I mean, this is a Joe Hill comic. Who You know, Joe Hill's uh, the guy behind Lock and Key, which we know is now coming to Netflix very soon. He's the guy behind Hill House Comics on DC Black Label. Um, I haven't gotten a chance to read this one yet. This is another one that I'm highly, highly anticipating. This is one that I think... Is it kind of like a no-brainer for adaptation? This is like it has option written all over it to me um, because it's not one that's set with like it's not it wouldn't be crazy high budget to do this. Um, so it's one that I like. Plus, we've talked about my beliefs on if you're going to invest in an IDW property, keep an eye out on those 125s. Um, I like that the 125 isn't just a color change the way the one in ten is. Um, but they were sitting at Midtown midway through today i don't know right now uh, when this show airs but they were sitting available um and i just think it's a case of so many like i said so many other books but like people that i really respect in the in, that are big time independent guys andy tomberlin of the indie spotlight series um dan piercy of d piercy comics on youtube if you're not following him go give him a follow um you know they they were big on this book this was one they were grabbing this is one you know I, i've had on my radar you and i we like to think of ourselves as indie comics aficionados. So um, this is one we, we've kind of earmarked and paid attention to. So it'll be interesting to see if this one gets some late heat. But um, either way, you know what? I love Under the Radar Comics. Yeah, it's one I have reserved at my LCS. I just need to go pick it up. Because once we were talking about it on the last call, I made sure I pre-ordered that one in 25. Yeah. 
Next one on the reader buzz is Undiscovered Country number two. Gorgeous covers, and that has been consistent with this series. Yeah, one's uh, what? Uh, the Francis Manipole is the, the cover on the right, right? Right. Um, and I think Kamakoli on the left. Um, this has been a series, tons of reader buzz, definite secondary market issues due to the you know abundance of print run. But number two, number two is rarely hit the list, right? We talk about that, the 50% drop off in um, purchases. Now I think you'll still see that because there was so much speculation driven buying on issue number one. But um, the, I could not leave this book off the list. So many people were posting and talking about it in anticipation of this release. Um, so those of you who are championing Undiscovered Country, keep doing it. That's how you get these books on the list. Um, and I think that the cover art has a lot to do with it. I think Scott Snyder and his social media activity have a lot to do with it. Um, so that's something you know to keep an eye out for. And we are, we know this has been an option to my readers out there. Be on the lookout for first appearances showing up in later issues, since we already know this is probably going to end up being a movie. It's already been optioned. Um, it's something I would pay attention to because there could be some stealth first appearances. Right, and keeping with that indie love, we got. Breathers number one. This was the last book I added to the list, Brian. This was one where it was like, I wasn't super familiar with it, but I keep seeing people late yesterday posting about it. So it was one that I had to add to the list at the last second. Um, a lot of people were hype about that uh, Lemire Kent variant. Um, so, you know. Had to add it to the list. This also um, had a higher MSRP, right? Wasn't it like six to ninety nine and eight ninety nine or something like that? Yeah, yeah, which I think obviously limits the scope of a book, right? Where it can I think we'll you know, we'll talk about that with like Ninja Turtles later. Um, the sort of you know, same thing with Spawn where it's like you really gotta be invested to buy it. It's easy when you're a property like Ninja Turtles or Spawn to ask that question. It's another thing when you're like leave on the light where they have that gold variant that they had the 9.99 cover price or you know this book where it has the higher cover price. But the concept of the book is interesting. So it's one that I want to check out um, and then again, you know, you guys get me hype. You guys get me that reader FOMO. Um, I don't get the I don't get this you can't get me with the speculation FOMO at this point. I'm too uh, I'm too seasoned, but the reader FOMO gets me when I when I feel like everybody's talking about a book that I was wasn't on my radar. I'm like, man, I got to check this thing out. Um, so this is one I, I'll be, I'll be hunting down to grab a copy to read. That wraps up the reader buzz section this week. So do us a favor, put it in the comments. What books have you guys picked up this week? What books have you liked? What books have you enjoyed reading? What books are you guys buying to flip? Always love to hear everyone's comments. We talk about community on this channel, one big community. So let's get that conversation going in the comments and in the live chat. If you're watching this during the premiere and if you're listening to this on the podcast, make sure you come back over and hit us in the comments on YouTube or just leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, wherever you're going to be downloading that podcast version from. But with that being said, we're going to get into the variant buzz section. First book we're talking about is... Undiscovered number one, this is the third print, right? Yeah, I'll be brief about this because we just talked about the second print, and this is popular for the same reason. Wraparound cover, new cover art. They're doing a real good job with the um, editorial over the kind of the variant colors that are coming out. I think that, you know, we've seen this with some other indie releases where when a book finally gets optioned, in this case it's already been optioned, but when it gets developed for the screen – you could see some serious heat on these later printings, which will undeniably have a much smaller print run than that first print. It looks very similar to the second print um, in kind of like the overall look and color aesthetic, but it's it's a completely different cover. You have the city in the other one here, that baby being front and center is kind of ominous. But uh, I like these two, the second print and third print. I think those are two great covers. And, and uh, if you see it, pick it up. Uh, I, you know, if you if you're an undiscovered country fan, if you have, especially if you're already invested in the first print, double down on those seconds and third prints. Yeah, I think it's great, especially if you're a completionist and you're collecting because you love the title and love the story for Undiscovered Country. I always find it weird how sometimes these second prints, 
Do you get that whole print run versus first available? Like some people go, no, that first print, it's the first one, the first one that came out. I want that one. I think that's going to be worth more. And then they're like, no, I want the later printings because there's only like 700 of them printed. It's just kind of weird. And it's interesting to watch. So we'll, it'll be uh, exciting to see how that kind of plays out. Yeah, and I fit into that color cover completionist category where it's like if I really like a book, I've got to have all the colors. Yeah. Yeah, except for when you're trying to do once in future, and they're like, "Oh, ho, ho, one more." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's for sure. But hey, hey, I, I'll chase as much yeah. as I gotta chase, like the next guy. Yeah. Then the next one we want to talk about for the variant buzz was Spawn. This is issues 300, 301, and 302. These are also additional printings, right? I think 300 is the fourth print. Yeah, and the funny thing about these is they almost seem unnecessary because there's the uh, the previous printings of each of these books um, were actually at like discount sales for Black Friday. So I don't really know what analytics image is looking at to get demand for these. But we've talked about how, and I, can, I keep saying this, but coming into the new year, we're going to do a whole video on late printings just to explain the process behind them. But late printings get created when, in short, when a book sells out at Diamond, not necessarily at your LCS. When it sells out at Diamond, and you can't get it anymore, but there's still stores calling, asking for it. So there must still be stores out there at, saying, I need Spawn 300. Um, I missed all of the other prints, or I sold out of all the other prints for them to create it. I think as each print progresses, I think we're going to see a smaller and smaller print run. And so the same thing we were just talking about with Undiscovered Country but on steroids because we talked about this um, last night on three up, three down. Spawn is a different beast when it comes to collecting. It has more completionists, more run builders than I think any property I've seen out there. Um, so it's something, this is a long-term play, but it's something to pay attention to because I can't tell you how many Spawn books come out and you're like, this is a dud. And then two years later, you're like, holy this is going for what? So if that's something to really to pay attention to, um, I, I think that, you know, these books are, could be sleepers down the road, especially that 300 with the homage. And that brings us to the conclusion of the variant buzz section. We covered a lot of those books that were on the variant buzz section previously on the Bolo list. So we're just going to go right through that. Now we're going to bring it into Jack's long-term play this week. Which we're talking about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number 100. Right. And now, if you go, went to simplemanscomics.com yesterday when the article form of the list went up, and I encourage everyone to do that, you kind of got like a brief description of why this book is popular to me. And I get to add a couple layers after having read the book. But first off, the, to me, the importance of this book is the anniversary, right? It's 100 issues. And very similar to what we just talked about with Spawn, and I compared these two in that. And I, I think that they're properties that are very similar. Yeah, one is image, one's IDW, different kind of target demographics maybe. But um, they're two properties where they may have a slightly smaller fan base than, say, Avengers or something more mainstream like that. But they have a more rabid fan base. They have a fan base that's much more loyal. If you're a Turtle fan, you are a Turtle fan. If you're a Spawn fan, you're a Spawn fan. And it's really rare to get these series that go so long that um, these Turtle books have been written. We're at issue number 100 since IDW took over the license. Um, and IDW's been planning these arcs in this story for just years. They put so much energy and effort into this. Um, I have no doubt that the property will probably stay with IDW for the foreseeable future. When we get around to talking about issue 200, no matter how much you think like issue 100 was overprinted, no matter how much the 7.99 price tag scared you away, I think this book will be a ghost by the time we're talking about issue 200. And that will cause serious secondary market demand because if you're a turtle fan, how are you not going to want this issue? 
how is this? I mean, it's issue number 100. Um, and all of the other previous Turtle series, they haven't had the same feel as this one, with the exception of the original run. Outside of that original run with Eastman and Laird, we haven't had... I mean, the Archie series was more based on the cartoon. Um, the Image series was kind of a mess. It was short-lived. Um, I don't think there was kind of full investment there. So this is really the Turtle series that has rebuilt, rebranded, re, um, you know, re kind of initiated a new readership to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I think the variants are great. You've got, you know, the one in 10, one in 25 and one in 50. I really like the cover B Eastman where you kind of got all the characters. I think there are several store variants that were created for this one that are awesome and unique and uh, there's some incredible artwork out there on the market. Um, but within the book, we knew that like Sh Shredder was probably coming back. We got to see that um, come to fruition. Um, he's no longer kind of like the hollow shell that he was. He returns. Um, cool imaging with like a big skull. Shredder makes his return. But you know what? Shredder kind of Throws us for a loop because he uh, he's kind of almost a good guy in the issue. Um, unfortunately, to those of us uh, who have loved the Turtles for years and years, we lost. We lost one of our own in this one as Master Splinter um, passed away. And he died kind of sacrificing himself for all of us. And there's a parallel between this, and it's very interesting, it's like Crisis on Infinite Earths is on TV. There's a real parallel between this and Crisis on Infinite Earths because that's essentially what's happening, right? There's a giant crisis in New York City um, sweeping the city. Um, a giant dragon comes down, uh, you know, and Splinter saves everyone by sacrificing himself. And there's this incredible panel of Shredder holding um, Splinter that really just homages uh it's it's a really a true homage to uh that crisis seven and eight with superman holding supergirl um and, and really the death of flash but it's really that Su supergirl cover um uh, incredible uh and you know shredder kind of tells the the turtles like you know specifically leonardo like, your father died with honor. He died to save all of us. Um, and, and it was kind of like that weird moment where, like, the Turtles and the, and Shredder are kind of... Shredder's kind of showing respect to the, to the Turtles and, more specifically, Splinter. There's another great panel. All the Turtles, April, Casey Jones, surrounding Splinter's body and kind of um, quietly mourning... And then if you wonder, if, you, if you're going to be cynical, if you didn't read the issue, and you're going to be cynical and go, didn't, didn't, wasn't Splinter supposed to have died before? Um, and there was a tease previously of Splinter dying in issue number 59, which was really the introduction of Jenica. It wasn't her first appearance, but it was like where we really got to know her. Um, you actually see Splinter with his wife up in, kind of up in heaven in the afterlife in this. So, like, I think this is permanent. I think this is a natural... Move And I think it kind of fits because we talked about this with the whole Jenica storyline where it really seemed like she was being groomed by Splinter to kind of be that replacement. And then there was the panel where um, Shredder lays Splinter down and he kind of like – he refers to Leonardo as master. So I really think Leonardo now takes this role of leadership within this team. Um so between between the death of Splinter, which is just going to make this an iconic issue for the years to come, between it being the, the centennial issue, um, I, I really believe, like, long term, this is a book every Turtle fan is going to have to have. So it's not the short term flip of the week. There's other books that we've talked about doing that on the secondary market. But long term, this is going to be a major important key issue um, that every Turtle fan is going to want to have. And I have faith in this franchise to only continue to expand and grow its fan base and its readership. So you mentioned a bunch of store exclusives. There were a bunch of store exclusives out there. But we want to talk about 
our channel sponsors, SlobbedHeroes.com. They has one up there right now, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number 100. It's up there. I think it's you can get this raw or you can get it graded on the website. And then, of course, our other channel sponsor, FrankiesComics.com, has that Clayton Crane. I guess you could say had that Clayton Crane. Pretty sure it's sold out because I don't even see it up on the site anymore. But yeah. they had that one up there as well. And then there was one other thing about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 100, right? Yeah, I cannot forget this. Um, maybe more exciting than the book itself, as exciting as the book was, the child in me screamed almost as I flipped that page and I see Eastman, Laird, the last Ronin, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Now, if you haven't seen the toys that made us yet, um, if you love the Turtles, it's almost an emotional episode. Because throughout the episode, beyond the discussion of the Ninja Turtles, there is this like emotional discussion going on between Eastman and Laird about it. They're falling out, right? They're, they're much publicized um, kind of breakup. How kind of Eastman was young and had money. Laird was a little older. Laird never wanted to leave the Ninja Turtle property. Eastman wanted to do other things. Um, his other things didn't quite do what the Turtles did. Um, I think he regretted it. He sold before Laird did. Laird made more money than Eastman. But Laird was smart enough to put a clause in there saying that he wanted to reserve the right for him to self-publish Ninja Turtle stories in the future in comics form. That has led us to where we are today because at the end of that episode, you see a very emotional Peter Laird reunited with Kevin Eastman for the first time in decades. And you can tell like it's awkward at first, but then they are like, it's like two brothers getting back together. And you watch that and it's funny, like I watched that with my brother and I said, man, I hope they do a comic together. Not realizing that some month later, we're going to get an announcement that we are going to get an Eastman and Laird Ninja Turtles. I presume miniseries called The Last Ronin. Um, I love that Tom Waltz is involved. He has been the man behind the Ninja Turtles IDW series the whole way. So hopefully it plays into continuity um, in some way. But how exciting is that? Uh, for an IDW fan, I'm getting in 2020 an Eastman and Laird Ninja Turtles miniseries and a Rob Liefeld Snake Eyes series. I'm ready for 2020. Yeah, I agree. That was a great episode of The Toys That Made Us. Learned a lot. I had the toys growing up as a kid. That was kind of my introduction. I think everyone's introduction kind of into Ninja Turtles. I was more into the toys than the comics. Um, I did start reading the comics later on, probably within the past last year. So I've been catching up on some of those. Outside of, like you said, I read some of the earlier ones. What was like the Archie ones? The cheesy, the cheesier ones. That was more my style because it reminded me of the cartoon at the time. But either way, Last Ronin, like you said, with those original Turtles creators, I think it's something that's going to be really great. Many series are not. It's going to be a fantastic read. You got the original creators. That'd be cool if they did some like Mirage type uh, homage or something to it, right? Yeah, I mean, I expect, honestly, like, I expect to see the marketing come out behind this one. So I would love to see some cool homages. I would love to see, I think the store retailer variants are going to come up for this one for sure. Um, I think we're going to see people get behind this. I think this is going to be a big deal as kind of the word gets out. I posted this in my Instagram story yesterday. So many people DM'd me in response to that. Um People who I don't know if they had not picked up the issue yet and weren't aware, but were just the reception for this. Everybody is nothing but positive and excited about the idea of Eastman and Laird Ninja Turtles. Like this is universally loved. I haven't heard a single person say anything bad about this. So this is going to be great. Right. And just like you said, if you're interested in seeing some of that extra content, follow AKA Mr. Bolo on Instagram or follow some men's comics on Instagram because we're always posting additional content on there. But that's a great long-term play. But we also got something else going on this weekend, right, Jack? Right. If you are in the Charlotte area, I talk oftentimes about doing conventions. This Sunday, December 15th, I will be doing Charlotte Comic Con, the winter show in Concord, North Carolina, right outside Charlotte. Uh, I encourage everyone local that's going to be at the show, come see me. Come talk to me. Um, you know, um, we're going to be selling out there. Uh, myself and, and my brother will be out there. Um 
throwing out deals, uh, you know, looking to kind of get together that cash for Christmas season, right? But, um, you know, come talk to me. Come come take a picture. Come say, hey, uh, a lot of times people see me at cons and you can kind of see them looking and they're maybe too shy to come up and be in, introduced. Except for one themselves. person. Bolo! Yeah, Carolina Chris. Um, yeah, he was he was the one that called me out real quick. But other than yeah, other than him, it seems like everybody's kind of shy. So absolutely, um, if you're in the area, I know there's a lot of people who watch um, this show who are local. Um, definitely, definitely uh, come say hi. And if you're in the area and you like weren't aware of this, I'm telling this is a great show. This is a true collector show. Uh, this is not like one of those like whole bunch of like artists. A whole bunch of media people. This is real dealers, uh, real like back old baseball issues. card shows. Exactly, exactly. And so it's a really a solid size too. Um, but it's 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 just like those old baseball card shows. It's every dealer is back issued. There's dealers who do nothing but dollar bin stuff, and then there's dealers who have every key you could imagine, um, graded, ungraded, all over the place. Um, there are like Funko people who have like the craziest Funko boosts you can see. Um, so these shows are really cool. I encourage you. It's five dollars to get in. Yeah, and so, that kids nine and under are free. Right, so you can't beat that. And the promoter of the show, Dave Henson, is a comic legend in the Charlotte area. He ran uh, Dave's Comics in Fort Mill, South Carolina. Rest in peace to Dave's Comics, man. We miss we miss that shop. But he ran that shop for like thirty years, um, and. Uh, if you ever heard me talk about my Walking Dead 193 experience, that was because Dave's Comics was closed and they, a new store opened and didn't last very long um, due to a lot of those customer service issues. So we miss Dave's Comics, but you can always shop with Dave at those shows. So come check me out. Come check the show out. Um, if you're local, I would love to see you. So again, click that thumbs up button for us. Let us know in the comment what books you guys bought this week. Also, congratulations once again to Lala Schultz. Make sure you email me at simplemanscomics at gmail.com. Get us your mailing address and we get that bolo box in the mail for you. And tune in tomorrow night. We got that live premiere of The Last Call where we are talking final order cutoff books for this coming Monday night. We talk about books that are coming up. We talk about books that just came out. And we even have videos on this channel now where we're talking about back issues to be on the lookout for. So we're covering every comic collector need like we said amplifying that collection through community and integrity right here on simple man's comics so make sure you subscribe and we will see you guys in the next video